movie. We said to take it out and to preach for us, and the family's going to sing for us, and uh, that'll be a blessing. So I'll have them to, to come now. We were in Africa for several years, and one of the ways that we taught some of the Africans to memorize verses was through putting some to music. Some we created ourselves, and some we stole from others. And so this morning, we had our first service out in Dalby. So glad that Neville and his wife could be with us. But um, we sang this song, Alice. Isn't that, isn't she his wife? <laughs> Okay, so we had Neville and his and Alice. I assume they're married. <laughs> Neville and his wife. He, Evelyn. Okay, I have these down low because when we sing. It's anyway, okay. So we taught the folks out there this song. It's in Mark 8 in verse number 36. If you want to look that up in your Bible, we'll sing it through a couple of times. <laughs> For what shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, for what shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, for what shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, for what shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Okay? <laughs> All right, or you can put that to another tune if you want to. But anyway, tonight I want us to look in the Bible at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you'd turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Corinthians 3, verse number 5, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5 says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, when we open up the Bible, we need to remember who wrote the Bible, and who's preserved it, and who uses it to speak to us. And so we would ask and pray that we would <clears throat> be faithful to the teaching, preaching, understanding, application of the Word. Lord, this passage is something that's been laid on uh, the preacher's heart tonight, and I trust we'll do justice to it. We pray that you would uh, touch some hearts and lives tonight. I know you've touched mine, and if that's the only one that needs to be touched, I'm grateful for people to hear how you've touched my heart about this. But Lord, I pray that we would um, go forth from here, perhaps challenged anew and afresh regarding uh, our relationship in this seed sowing and harvesting business, and the relationship of others, and the uh, work, most of all, that you have done, are doing, and will do in people's lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we moved to Australia, we heard about op shops. But being from America and being from South Africa, we didn't know what an op shop was. Well, we knew what an op shop was. We just didn't know that they were called op shops. 
And so we got here, and the people we were staying with on the south side of Brisbane talked about going to op shops, and we hopped in the car and went to a thrift store. We went to an op shop and went to a couple of them. Now, you all know what an op shop is. How many of you like shopping at op shops like I do? Can I see your hands? You like to do that, okay? Now, you know you can find just about anything in an op shop. You could probably you know, furnish your house or your wardrobe from an op shop. Uh, we didn't realize that when we moved here and we were told, well, we've got everything you need at op shops and so you don't really even have to bring your suitcases. You can just kind of come on the plane. Well, you know, in op shops, sometimes you can find a bargain, sometimes you can find a good deal, and then sometimes maybe you can't. So I guess you have to shop a lot at these op shops to see when you get a good deal and, and when you don't. Well, I, I enjoy camping. We don't do a lot of camping, but <clears throat> before we left the States, we bought some little five dollar camping chairs and they are worth about three dollars okay they are horribly uncomfortable they are very narrow for some of us are getting a little wider you know as age goes on but we were in an op shop down in logan and here sitting out front for only six dollars was the nicest camp chair that I think I, well, one of the nicest I've ever seen. It didn't have a shelf on the side, but probably in the stores it was worth 40 or 50 bucks, and here it was $6. You know, and I'm kind of tight, so I thought, oh, that's not a good deal. And I walked over to the car, and then I thought, you know, really, that is a pretty good deal. I shouldn't try to get a chair like that any cheaper. And I went back, and I got me a $6 camping chair, which Brother Neville got to sit on last night when they were out there to our place. You know, that was a gem that I found at an op shop. Well, I don't want to talk about op shops tonight, but I want to talk about op crops. An op crop. An op shop, they tell me, is an opportunity shop. That's what the op stands for. Am I right? Okay. So I got this gem at an op shop. And you know, when it comes to God's crops, I mean, out there in Dalby, where we are, the other side of Toowoomba, it's farming ground. They're in the midst of harvesting their cotton now. They harvest most of their sorghum here a few weeks ago. They harvested some corn. In fact, one of the farmers that we met actually called us up <coughs> and said, come on out, we're harvesting the last paddock of corn. You can ride up in the harvester. And so we hopped in the vehicle and went out there and got to ride in this nice, big, expensive machine and talked to Jamie as we went back and forth down the field a little bit, you know. But think of, a, think of an op shop and how you find a gem there. And I want to think about a harvest. You know, here we are in, in Brisbane tonight, and uh, I don't know, a couple of million people around, and six and a half million people in Queensland. A lot of people. A lot of people, you know, I grew up outside of a town of 500, so when I go to Dolby and it has 12,000 people, I see a lot of people. And there are a lot of people that have a lot of needs. And you know what I'm asking for from God? I'm asking God for a gem in the middle of that crop. Lord, if you just give us a gem, would you give us one that we could see come to know the Lord? <clears throat> and that's my prayer, and I'd ask you to pray with us along that line. One of the folks that came to the service, and we were uh, glad that uh, you shared one of your families. In fact, I don't know how many of you know this, but actually the hymn books that you replaced were given to us and this morning was the first chance we had to use those hymn books. And that was a real delight to have your family there as we opened up the, and they looked like brand new, you know. So, um, in fact, I don't know what Pastor did with the money. I gave him $20 a book for it. So, there was about $500 someplace should have been extra in the offering. No, I'm just teasing. We, we appreciated those songbooks, and we look forward to using them in the future. But one of the men who came from Dolby is the first man that we met in Dolby. We live not too far from a museum, and we had moved in on the 13th of November, which was a Tuesday. <clears throat> a couple days later, I took the two kids, and we just went for a walk, and we came to this museum, and it's a pretty nice museum, outdoor museum. We walked in, didn't see anybody, didn't see anybody, and then we rang the bell, and a man came out, and his name happens to be Garth. Uh, Garth is 69, 70 years of age was the only child. His parents have passed away, of course, never married, of course, never had any children, never had any place to go for Christmas Day, so he came to our house. 
And we've seen him several times <clears throat> now. We've had a lot of interaction with Garth, and he showed up today and was thankful for I don't know, you know, um, he needs to be saved. He grew up in a uniting church, but he needs to be saved. I've talked to him enough to know that he's, he's not saved, but he needs to be saved. I don't know if that's the gem in God's crop that he's going to give us or not. I, I don't know. Uh, like to see him saved, like to see some other folks saved too. Um, but what's interesting here in light of this passage here, you know, it talks about Paul and talks about Apollos and talks about God. <clears throat> Let me tell you another quick story. One of the reasons we had this service this morning was two weeks ago, I got a text about 4.30, 5 o'clock on a Sunday night. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I have done door knocking or letterboxing in almost all of Dolby. And I got a text from a lady who said, uh, Pastor, uh, my name is, and she gave me her name. She said, we have been looking for an independent Baptist church in Dalby. We live in Dalby. She said, we Googled independent Baptist churches, and we found one in Toowoomba, and we went to Toowoomba this morning, and the pastor there told us about you guys here in Dalby, and that's why I'm writing you. Now, we wrote back and forth a little bit, and I got so excited about what I was reading. But here's what happened. She told me where they lived, and I got out my map of Dalby. I didn't recognize that street, Reed Street. I looked on my map, and here I had done all the major streets, almost all of them this way, and I'd done all of them this way, and tucked down in between two north and south streets was this little, little short street called Reed Street. And I thought, why, how did I miss that? And so, Monday morning, I went over there, and I counted there were only five mailboxes on Reed Street, there's being one, and I thought, I wonder if, I just wonder if this is this family that I've been communicating with, and knocked on the door, and, and the husband came to the door and invited me in, just happened to be off work that day. His wife happened to be off work, and they live, her parents live with them. And so two Filipino families there in this house. And we had a wonderful, wonderful time of fellowship on Monday morning. It'll be two weeks ago now, tomorrow. They invited us over for a meal on Thursday, which happened to be my wife's birthday. And they fed us Filipino, you know, dishes. They didn't give us balut. If any of you are from the Philippines and you know what balut is, I said, please, no balut. I don't want balut. You don't know what balut is. as Brother Carver. He'll tell you what balut is. I'm sure he's eating it somewhere along the line. <laughs> but it was like the Lord was tapping me on the shoulder and saying, Jerry, you know, you think you're canvassing all these streets and you think you're trying to find, but you know what? You miss this street back here and you miss this little street and you missed a couple of families on this little street. Now, would you come back here? And you see, it really wasn't Paul and it really wasn't Apollos. It's, it's really the Lord doing the work here. I want you to look tonight here, if you will, at some truths about what's necessary for an op crop. What's necessary for an op crop? Let me give you some truths. First of all, in verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, you find there's partnership. There's partnership, which I've already talked about. And here Paul lists human, this human aspect and the divine aspect. Uh, God does use us, but he is the one that is doing the giving the increase here. You know, when it comes to our responsibility as humans, I think we could maybe boil it down to two things, and one is communication and the other is compassion. We need to communicate the gospel. God has given us the gospel to communicate either through tracts or personal witnessing or Bible studies or uh, testifying, something like that. We, we need to do that. We ought to do that. I know it never really gets easy to do, but Mark 16, 15 is still in the Bible. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We need to communicate the gospel. We need to give the gospel. But then I think another very, very key area is not just communication, but compassion. And we need to live the gospel. And Jude says, and some having compassion, making a difference. And sometimes people need to not just hear it, but actually see it. And, of course, we're finding this out, out, in, um, out there in Dalby. And I, I could probably just fill our time with stories tonight of different folks that we have met, and then the Lord has enabled us to meet them again and minister to them in some particular way, in a unique way. And we desire to, to do that, to give it and to live it. That's very, very, very important. So there's the human aspect of partnership, but then there's that divine aspect of 
this partnership. You know, when it comes to salvation, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God the Father is the one who conceived this idea. Let's turn to Ephesians. It's just a few books past Corinthians. I'm sure that most of you are aware of that. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. God is the one who's laid out the plan of salvation. And I'm not a Calvinist uh, at all. You know, I believe that God works in every life in some way. I think that many people are not responding to that, but I believe that He does that. But He's the one who has certainly conceived this idea. Down in verses 11 and 12 it says, "...in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will." that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Now, God the Father sent the Son. That was His responsibility. And, of course, you know, planning this and so on, we understand. But I want you to understand that God the, the Son also has an aspect in saving people, and that is that He had to shed His blood. He had to condescend and be crucified. If you keep on going to Philippians chapter 2, not, a, not an unfamiliar passage, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we see God the Father is the one who uh, conceives this. Jesus is the one who condescends and is crucified. But then there's the work of the Holy Spirit as well when it comes to this crop of uh, being harvested. Uh, he is the one who stirs the heart. He is the one who convicts and converts. John chapter 16 and verse number 8 tells us that when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 says that the people there after the preaching of the Word of God were pricked in their hearts. Uh, Felix trembled out of conviction in Acts 24 and verse 25. And then Titus 3 and verse number 5 tells us that we are uh, um, uh, born again as a result of the work of the Spirit of God in our heart. So there's this partnership, okay? We have a responsibility. God has His responsibility. Obviously, we cannot save souls, but we do need to give the Word, and it's good to give the Spirit of God something to work on. It's good to at least leave a verse with somebody. Uh, one of the verses that I use regularly is Hebrews 9.27. Um, and as is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. I like to leave people that with the thought that they're going to die and they're going to face God, okay? And are they ready for that? Uh, the older I get, probably the more attracted I am to older people, and I meet a lot of older folks. I'm not 70. I know pastor just had a birthday, and so 90, 91, what are you? No, just kidding. Okay, happy birthday. And uh, I meet people, I, one of the questions I ask them is, did you go to Sunday school when you were a kid? I had a guy the other day, 80-some years of age, almost 90, and he said, Yeah, I went to such and such a church until I was 13, and then I haven't been to church for 60 or 70 years or 80 years or something. And that's sad. And I've said to people, maybe you've heard this expression, you got one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel. You know, you're ready to die. You need to be taking stock of this. So we need to communicate that and communicate truth and give <laughs> You know, the Spirit of God is something to work. We need to do that. It's important that we do that. And then let God work on them. So there's partnership. But in our text, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there's not only partnership, but there's planting. There is planting. There's the seed that's necessary. When Paul says, I have planted. Okay, he planted a seed. Now, seeds are normally small. The Bible mentions mustard seeds, which are very small. And God can do great things with you know, just a little seed. <clears throat> Out our way, we have the Bunya Mountains. And perhaps you've been to the Bunyas or perhaps you've seen a Bunya seed. Those things are mammoth. 
You don't want to be under a bunya tree when those seeds are about ready to fall. Our neighbors actually uh, gave us, it's actually a pod of several seeds, and they actually boiled this thing up and gave us some of the seeds to eat. I, I could take it or leave it. it. To me, it wasn't that tasty, but it could mean my taste buds are, are getting old. But you think about a seed. A seed has life within it, and that's why even the, the shortest of Bible verses as a seed, you know, the Bible tells us in the book of Mark that the seed is the Word of God. In Psalm 126, verse 6, it talks about going forth, bearing precious seed. You know, I would encourage you to carry a gospel track. Uh, we were in a church service out at Garden City Baptist a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday night, and the pastor encouraged us to <coughs> maybe give our testimony, write out our testimony. Now, our sending church is the Lehigh Valley Baptist Church in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. And if you were to Google that and go online and find our website, you would find that there's several, uh, there's, I guess, a section there, several pages of personal testimonies. I think mine is entitled, Four Words That Changed My Life. Um, and it wasn't be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> but uh, I decided I would write a personal testimony track for the Dolby area. Because people were often, ask, often asking me, why Australia or why Dolby? So after he gave that challenge on that Wednesday night, I went back and on Thursday I decided I'm going to write this testimony track. It's going to incorporate my personal testimony and how the Lord has led. So I made this trifold track up entitled, Why Dolby? From America Through Africa into Australia. I'm going to tell about how I got saved and then how the Lord uh, led us to Pennsylvania, and then eventually to Africa, and then into Australia. I printed up 10 of those tracks, <clears throat> folded them, put them in the car, and the next day, just out and about running errands, my accent gives it away, people said, four people said, why Dolby? I said, oh, glad you asked, here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll be interested in this, you know. And so perhaps, like we have a lady back in her home church, she went through a bout with cancer. And so the title of her track is, When the Doctor Said the C Word. Well, man, that track can be used with cancer patients, especially. We have a lady in our church that got saved. She used to work in an abortion clinic. And she wrote a testimony about how she got saved. I mean, those are hot issues. And it may be that you have gone through some sort of a challenge or difficulty or a tragedy of some sort. Maybe that's God wanting to use that in your life, and not just in your life, but maybe somebody else that's experiencing the same thing. And if you were to just put that together and you say, well, I'm not a writer. Well, you know, maybe there's some folks in the church here that are, and you could tell them the story, and they could write that up and, uh, you know, print it off on a copier, and who knows? I mean, even if you gave out one a week in a year's time, there's 50 seeds that you have sown of uh, just sometimes in the coming out through the, uh, through the till and talking to people there at the cash register and just say, hey, here's a story of my life, you know. Of course, we put a picture on there, and I would encourage you, if you're a lady, to put a picture on there with your husband or, you know, try to zero in on giving it to ladies. Or if you're a man, put a picture on there with your wife, and uh, that way you can feel free to give it to a lady as well. But something like that, a, a seed that's so necessary there that incorporates the Word of God and perhaps a testimony. So there's the partnership, there's the planting we see here, but then I want you to consider the perspiration. Okay, the perspiration. In verse 6, uh, it says, I have planted, Apollos watered. And then it, it talks about laboring in verse number 8. Now he that planteth, he that watereth, or one, every man shall receive his reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together. It's work. Okay, it's work to do this. We have to keep that in mind that it takes effort. It takes labor. It take, we, we must do that, okay? Now, I realize that a church doesn't just exist just for evangelism, but that is. I mean, there's, there's, we want to glorify the Lord, and so we don't want to compromise that for the sake of evangelism. Uh, there's discipleship, you know, uh, but we do need to see that we do need to be a lighthouse, in our area, and I like this little map over here, and I hope that the area is getting cover covered. Is it getting colored? Is there red there? Wonderful. That's, that's tremendous. Okay, that's a good, good, good thing to do. And so to be doing that, because you never know. I remember when we were here the last time, and Pastor was challenging to take a map or something, and just to put a, 
uh, tract in there and let God do the work. And that's something that you can do here. In the States, you can't put tracts in letterboxes like that, which you can here. And so a lot of folks are, are uh, able to do that. I trust that you're doing I trust that you'll get involved in that. It's not as hot. I mean, when we were here, it was up around 37, 38, 39 degrees. It's not quite that hot, and so it's easier perhaps to get out. I want you to look at something. Go, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at the Apostle Paul and how much he worked at this business of laboring for souls. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. Now, if you stopped right there and you followed his missionary journeys, you'd say, wow, that guy went all over. He went all over. And he didn't have a nice Prado like I have. You know, in labors, more abundant. And then he talks about his sufferings there, his stripes above measure, what he was willing to suffer. I mean, Josh and I were out the other day, and one of the things that I do is I, I decided to do this just a couple of weeks ago, actually, to carry a few of these uh, paperback free Bibles with me and say to people, um, listen, you know, I'm, I'm new in the area, I'm a pastor in the area, and... Um, I'm giving out free Bibles. I don't know, maybe, maybe don't. The very first lady that we met did not have a Bible. And we were able to give her a Bible. Now we got to some other homes. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got a lot of Bibles. And one family, as soon as they saw the Bible, said, No, no, we don't want it. Get out of here. Okay. <clears throat> but that might be something that you could be involved in. But, you know, sometimes we suffer a little bit. And we say, Oh, I'm not going back to that street. I'm not going back to that person. You know? But we haven't suffered stripes and prison and deaths, so to speak. <clears throat> and then he mentions some of those stripes there. Forty stripes, say one. Thirty-nine stripes, five times. Boy, if we got beaten one time, one stripe, well, that's enough for me. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. And he's talking about, look in verse 26, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils, 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 all these places. Verse 27, weariness, painfulness, watchings often, hunger, thirst, fastings often, cold nakedness. Wow. Now, there's an example of somebody who perspired, somebody who labored. And why did he do that? Well, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 tells us why he did that. 2 Timothy 2 Verse number 9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may have also obtain the salvation. He wanted people to get saved, okay? So the end of my testimony track on why Dalby, you know, is, I mean, I've, I've run into people who say, well, I go to the Baptist church, I go to the Presbyterian church. When they tell me they go to the Baptist church, I say, oh, what's your testimony? You know how many people from the Baptist church have given me their testimony? And I've met probably four to six people. Not one. One older guy, I met him. I said, are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. I said, oh, when did you get saved? Oh, a long time ago. Oh, well, tell me about it. Oh, I don't have time. Okay. Presbyterian church supposedly preaches the gospel and I've run into them. And I asked one guy, I said, are you saved? He said, well, I was a Catholic, now I'm a Presbyterian. I said, but are you saved? Well, I was a Catholic. I told you I was a Catholic. I changed churches. I've heard that so many times. The closest person that's given me a testimony was the secretary at the Presbyterian church. And her testimony was, well, I was going through some troubles and now I'm not. A little bit more detail, but basically that was boiled down. Well, I don't know. So the end of my testimony track says, I don't know why I'm in Dolby. I said, maybe it's because, Lord, you know, you need to be saved. God wants to save you and change your life and set you on a new course. That's the only thing I can figure out. I don't know. <clears throat> but it takes perspiration. And then I want you to see back in our text, it takes not only partnership and planting and perspiration, but it takes precipitation. Precipitation. Here he talks about watering. 
watering. And notice carefully, it says Apollos watered, but then if you look at verse number seven, right in the middle, it says, neither he that watereth. It's got that E-T-H on the end. All right? Verse number eight, now he that planteth and he that watereth. All right? It takes not just one seed, but several seeds, just like it takes more than one rainfall. Now, we're out there in that area where we don't get a lot of rain. I haven't gotten a lot. We did get some a couple of weeks ago. But I've realized that in the planting of the seed and in the watering there, just like it's hot and dry and the soil is parched, it's like that spiritually. And it is going to take time to sow and to water Things are not going to happen overnight like we would like to see, but it's going to take that watering. Now, what is that watering when it comes to uh, spiritual work or a crop? Well, I think it takes consistency. We need to be faithful. We need to be consistently telling and consistently living and looking for opportunities to water the seed that we've sown. It takes consistency. I think, second of all, it takes cleanliness in our own lives, a, a lifestyle that backs up our words. And if we say the Lord has changed our life, you know, and then we blow up when the neighbor cuts his grass and his grass blows over on our driveway, that doesn't sound like we're being very faithful to, oh, the Lord's really changing all oh, he has? And get upset about a little grass on your driveway? It takes consistency and cleanliness, and then it, I believe it takes commitment. And here's an interesting thing. You never know when you talk to somebody if that person has a saved relative or a friend that's witnessed to them before. You don't know that. I was going down this street and I saw a bloke sitting kind of out of a little shack and I could have just dropped this in his box. He never would have seen me, but I started walking back there and he looked up at me. His name is Steve. And got to chatting with Steve a little bit. Well... Steve, come to find out, worked out in a, a mine and then kind of did some trucking with a mine way out west. And he hurt his leg. And so the nearest hospital that could help him was Toowoomba. But he had to move close to Toowoomba because he, they couldn't get him in to work on it. So he had to live someplace. So he lived in Dalby. And he was there for three months before they could get him in to work on him. And then when they worked on him, I met him about a month after that. He still had two or three months of recovery, and so I met him. And as I chatted with him, I found out that he said, yeah. Now, I don't know that he's saved. I, I really tend to believe that when people are saved, they live for the Lord, and if they don't, God spanks them, and maybe God was spanking him. I actually suggested that because he told me that he had gotten saved several years ago. Well, now... Isn't that interesting that, I don't know that he sees it, but I see his injury from hundreds of kilometers west of us and coming to Toowoomba and then living in Dalby and happy to be outside his house, not able to get around too well because of the cast that he had on his leg. And I, to me, that says God's trying to speak to that man's heart one way or the other. <clears throat> but we need to have that, I mean, Commitment. I've gone back there twice. Debriana made some, what do you call cookies here? Bickies? You maybe don't know what cookies are. I don't know. Bickies, biscuits, whatever. Oh, he loved those. Then I went back the next time to see him. It took about the third visit for him to open up and sense my genuineness with him. I probably should have went and got him for the service today. But it takes commitment on our part to water, water, and, and not really be satisfied, well, I've sown a seed. Let's be committed to watering that seed. It takes consistency and cleanliness and commitment, but then it takes confidence, okay? So, you know, as long, I, <laughs> I moved to Weatherly, Pennsylvania in 1986 and started knocking on doors in 1986. That's a long time I've been knocking on doors and talking to people. And you know, folks, really, there are times where I, I still get a little nervous. Like, I don't know. Like the other day I went out and 
I said, okay, Lord, if anybody is out in their yard as I'm letterboxing, I'll talk to them. And I don't know why I picked this particular street, but I was going down this particular street, and as I was going down across the street, I heard voices behind a hedge. And so I had like one more box on this side. Then I crossed the street, and I came up, and I could have hidden behind the hedge. They never would have seen me. But I decided, okay, now, Lord, I told you that I'd talk to people, and I hear these people are out. And so I peeked around the hedge, and I started to walk up this ramp to the veranda, and they recognized before I recognized them. Do you know that one week before, I had met them an hour away in Oki? And what I didn't know is that that man, Roy, pray for Roy. Roy that I met a week before is there on the veranda. His dad had died the day before. Now, what are the chances in a town of 12,000 that I would just happen to pick that street and they would happen to be out in the veranda and I would happen to say, God, I'll talk to somebody and I come around the hedge and here's Roy. And when they told me the dad had died, I said, could I have a word of prayer? And I don't normally do this. I don't know why I did this. I don't know why I did this. But they had a handicapped girl, and there's another little girl there. And you know what I did? I, I don't normally do this, and I don't think you have to do this, but I just got on my knees right there, and I said, let's pray. I got down on my knees, and I started to pray. And I'm going to tell you something. When I got off my knees, there weren't very many dry eyes. I think that was God clearly directing me that day to that house at that time to talk to them about just to show a little compassion and say, let's have a word of prayer. We ran into them at the Dolby show then on Friday. Oh, man, they were excited to see they got to meet my wife. And, and the daughter, the daughter, Misty, is a cadet with Josh. And so there's that. I mean, it's just <sighs> praise the Lord, you know. But it takes that, that precipitation. And then I want you to see the power that's involved here in verses 6, 7, and 9 where it says, It's God, it's God, it's God. It's God that giveth the increase. Uh, we're laborers together with God. You're God's husband. You're God's building. It's God doing this. And he is the one to get the, he is the, one to get the glory, um, you know, in, in all of this. I want you to think in your, in your Bible history of the miraculous births in the Bible. Can you think of one? Give me the name of someone who was miraculously conceived or born. Josh? Samuel? Isaac, John the Baptist, okay, and Lord Jesus, and all these different ones, you know. All right, now, who gave that conception? It was God, you know, and, you know, God is, and God gets the glory for that. And to God be the glory, you know, when, when this Filipino lady was texting me two weeks ago, and she texted me, now get this, I don't know how many of you know, I know Brother Carter knows a fellow named Buddy Smith up the line. Back in maybe 2007, 2008, I got some emails and, and Brother Buddy had written an article and I liked the article and I started writing him. And we became kind of Skype friends and email friends and things like that. And he finally invited me, now listen, he invited me to come to Australia in 2012. I couldn't come, but in 2013 I could. And so I flew through Sydney and I jumped right over you guys and I flew up there to Cairns and up into Milanda there and, and preached a missions conference for him and, and went back. That was five and a half years ago. I Googled immigrating to Australia. There's a whole testimony about that and how the Lord led, blah, 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 blah. Two weeks ago, that lady texted me that moved from the Philippines, she said, we moved here five and a half years ago and we have been praying for an independent Baptist church in Dalby for five years. I talked to her husband. He said, ah, it's somewhere between five and six years. Do the numbers on that. I don't understand that. How does God put his hand on somebody in South Africa who's a permanent resident there who's working with guys... And somebody here is saying we want an independent bet. How does that work? How does that work? If you leave God out of the equation, it doesn't work. But if you put God in the equation, it works. I don't know. <clears throat> and that's God. 
you know, and if anything gets going out there, and <laughs> it's going to have to be the Lord. He's going to have to say, hey, you missed Reed Street here. It's got five out of the house on it. You missed it. <laughs> we went to uh, breakfast that the Western Downs Regional Council was having on Australia Day. Sat down at a table, and there was another couple there, Keith and Charmaine. I got to talking. I gave him my business card. Oh, I need to bring the kids out sometime. And don't you know, she, she called us out. I didn't have their number. She called me. She says, hey, come on out to the farm. Okay. And then they called us when it was harvest time. Hey, we're harvesting. Now, they want to, when we get back from the States, they feel they're going to be ready to harvest some of their cotton. They want to call us out again. I don't They live 8, 10 kilometers out. Down this long, I don't know how that all that works, you know. Why do we sit at that table with them, you know? But that's God. And salvation is a miraculous work of God. In the book of Galatians chapter 1, I want you to consider this verse, Galatians 1, verses 23 and 24. Galatians chapter 1, 23 and 4. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which he once destroyed, and they glorified God in me. When Paul got saved, God got the glory, you know. And, uh, man, I hope you walk away tonight saying, wow, to God be the glory. You know, great things he has done, is doing, will do, you know. So there's the partnership, the planning, the perspiration, the precipitation, the power, and then the produce in verses 6, 7, and 9 where he says, God gives the increase, God gives the husband. You know, the produce is the farmer's desire. That's what he longs for. The produce is the farmer's defense. That's how he pays his debt. I don't know if pastors ever come across these books. Brother Carver, maybe you have. The Baptist Debt to the World and the World's Debt to the Baptist. You know, we have a debt to the world, and that's the gospel. And how do we pay God back? How do you pay God back? I mean, you really can't, but I mean, if he saves your soul, what do you want to do? You want to tell somebody else. That's, that's kind of a way that we pay this debt. So there's the farmer's desire in his defense, and it's his delight. Paul talked about the Philippians being his joy and his crown, I mean, the produce. Now, I know that, theoretically speaking, we should be happy if we just get to give the gospel. My goal is, when I'm out there, is to go out every day for a couple hours. And whether I'm running errands or what, well, I was running an errand one day, and there was a lady parked right next to me. And as I started to get in my car, I was going to put something in the driver's She was getting out. Her name was Lana. And uh, anyway, I said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. No, that's okay. I got to chat with her. I witnessed to her in the middle of the street. We were standing behind the cars as the cars were coming up. Oh, what better time to, you know, and she was all mixed up about some things. But I was able to give her a gospel track, talk to her about the Lord, challenge her with her relationship with God. So, you know, my desire is to try to talk to somebody in some way and share the gospel in some way. Why? Well, it, it's, I know it's delightful to do that, but I really want to see an op crop. I really want to see a gem. I really want to see someone come to know the Lord, and that's going to be a tremendous day when even one, whether it's a child or a neighbor or a colleague or a stranger, whoever. But then lastly, I want you to consider in verse number 8 the promise as he says, everyone, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And he talks here basically about the principle of sowing and reaping. And I know that you're familiar with these. You know, we always reap what we sow in quality. If you sow cotton, you're going to reap cotton. If you sow good, you're going to reap good. If you sow bad, you're going to reap bad. We need to sow spiritual things. I know that we need to establish rapport and relationships and things like that, and we're doing that and have done that. But I really want to see us sow spiritual things. We reap what we sow. We reap really more than we sow in quantity. We sow the wind and reap the whirlwind in a negative sense, but we do reap more than we sow in time. And then we reap proportionately to what we sow. We sow little, we reap little, we sow a lot, we reap a lot. And then we always reap after we sow. Uh, there is often a delay, you know, and often we, we quit right before we should. You know, um, I realize that I'm the new kid on the block. 
and I need to be listening to guys who have been around here in Australia for 30, 40 years, and I hope I am. I hope I'm learning from them. Um, but I know that after a person is on a foreign field for about six months, this happened to me in South Africa. When I was in South Africa, about six months, I knew, wow, I just got this loneliness feeling. And we landed here the first part of September, so October, November, December, January, February, March, April. We're in that seventh month. We're not going back to the States because we're lonely. I really don't want to go back. It was cheaper for me to get two tickets for my son and his bride to come this direction than for four of us to go that direction. So, and by the way, we can always Skype these things. They're watching on YouTube, you know, but we have to go back, you know. You know, and you have all these kids. I don't know if you know we have 11, you know. It'd be nice if they just all line up and say, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. That'd be so much easier, you know. We flew back how many times for weddings in Africa and now this. And I've told these two they can't get married, you know. <laughs> Need to take care of us when we get old. <clears throat> My wife and I were <clears throat> having a debate at the table here a few months ago. And we had, one of us had forgotten something, forgotten something. And we were arguing about a fork or something that, where's my fork? And she had two forks, but it wasn't my fork. And here I'd left my fork up at the bench. But anyway, and my daughter there said, um, Dad, when does it start? I said, what start? Um, taking care of you and Mom when you get old. <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks ago, she came to me and she said, Dad, I need to get my driver's license. I said, why? She says, well, you need somebody to drive you as you get old. Hmm. So he hasn't learned. That's not the way to get your driver's license from your dad when you tell him he's an old guy, you know. All right, so tried to give you a little bit of report of what's going on out in Dalby. Trust that you pray. I, I tried to help you see tonight here uh, what we need to do, what we're seeking to do. And, you know, pray for us. We pray for you. I pray for your, your pastor here every Wednesday. And uh, maybe if he needs prayer on Thursday for me, he's in trouble. But I do pray for him on Wednesday. And we value your church. And thank you so much for the investment that you're making in our labors out there in Dalby. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for establishing this church. I think of Brother uh, Bartlett, who started this work and the work in Toowoomba and both churches having a couple there to represent his desire for Dalby and years ago. Thank you for what you're doing there. Thank you for the different ones whose lives you're enabling us to touch. And Lord, uh, making a little bit of an impact, we trust and hope and pray. We think of the different ones, be they in town or uh, on the farm or in the shops or on the bus or in the park, Lord. Uh, we know that ultimately it is you that gives the increase. Help us be faithful. Help uh, Fellowship Baptist Church here to be faithful in distributing tracts, doing their uh, letterboxing, talking to souls, and just trusting you for the, the end result, Lord. Pray that uh, you will be glorified, that you are being glorified uh, in their efforts here. Thank you for what you're doing. Trust that you'll continue to uh, honor yourself in and through our labors, whether it's in a city like this or whether it's in farming area like Dalby. Uh, use us, we pray, if you'd be pleased to, in Jesus' name. Amen.